after 18. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can talk louder. I think it's for her and video. So I study individual variation and collective behavior. And by that, I mean the, the coordinated actions of animal groups, such as fish stools, and bison herds, bird flocks, and potentially some primate groups like baboons. And so the um, underlying um, idea of collective behavior is that it is self-organized. Um, so there is no central control. There is no one individual that tells everyone else what to do. Um, these complex behaviors that we see are coordinated using simple individual-based local behavioral rules. And we see these global level patterns emerge from the interactions among um, these low, lower level system components. Now, traditional studies of fish schools and how they coordinate their movements and so on treat all the individuals in the group as, this, as pretty much the same. They give them all the same behavioral rules and, and then run their simulations and, and, and look at what they do. Um, and so rarely is individual variation considered um, in these studies of um, collective actions. Um, now I study ants, so you might think at first, well, by looking at this picture, what kind of individual variation might there be in this system? Uh, but first of all, you can paint them individually, and so then you can see a lot of individual variation. And not only because of their color differently, you can actually track individuals over time and see that they behave differently. So they either perform different tasks or they perform their tasks differently. Some are uh, more active in their task and some are not as active in what they do or not as persistent as they do. Um, the nice thing about social insects is that there is more than one level of individuality. So I just showed you the workers. Um, and this is an example of a termite mound. So at the, the co a colony of a termite, there is a hyrex, which is about the size of a cat here for scale. And termites obviously are very, very small um, insects. And so what we have here is um, a colony of many, many termite workers. And in, in, in social insects, Evolution, I guess selection acts at the level of the colony. And so uh, we can go around and look at different colonies and see variation among these colonies and, and look at how they survive in different environments. Um, and so um, the main in question that I'm interested in when I look at individual variation in social insects is how um, individual variation at the colony level emerges from variation at the worker level. And so if the reproductive unit is the colony um, and we have uh, selection acting on the colony, that will determine what it, how it does in different types of environments. Um, and so how variation at this level of the workers influences variation at um, this level of the colony is a pretty important question to examine. And so um, when I think about this variation at the collective level, um, I'll, most of my talk I'll, talk I'll discuss this middle part and how worker composition in a colony influences its behavior. There is other... Um, I'll briefly mention at the end kind of the other sides of this um, scheme, but most of the talk will focus on worker composition. And so when we think about worker composition, uh, let's say we go to the field and we look at two colonies. We have the blue colony and the red colony. Um, and the blue colony um, is, exp let's say we give them some food, and the blue colony is much slower at finding this new food than the red colony. And so we can come up with different hypotheses of why we observe this difference between these colonies. So the first one is that the mean behavior of the individuals that comprise these groups are different. So for example, um, the exploratory behavior of the blue colony is much lower overall than that of the red colony. Um, an alternative hypothesis that's not mutually exclusive is that there is a difference in the distribution of behaviors of workers. So for in this example, the mean is the same, but the red colony has a few individuals out here that are very fast. And so then when we look at the colony behavior, we see this colony as being faster and finding the food faster than the blue colony. And then the third hypothesis is um, that maybe there is no difference between um, the composition of the red colony and the blue colony, but something about the environment is different. So for example, maybe the blue colony is under a tree and the red colony is out in the open, and so the sun reaches it faster and ants warm up sooner, and so they just are active sooner than the blue colony, and that's why they find um, the food source faster. OK, so I'll start with a quick example for um, this different mean hypothesis. And then I will focus most of the talk on the different distributions and end it with a, an example of different environments. So the first example about different means is, comes from the Argentine ants. So if you have ants in your home, these are 
the Argentine ants most likely. Um, so these are invasive species that come from Argentina, um, and they, they've been extending, expanding their range in, in California, actually throughout the world. And the way they expand is through the disper dispersal and establishment of propagules, which are a group of individual, a group of workers with one or more queens. And so we, we wanted to know how the speed and accuracy of nest choice by, nest choice by these uh, propagules is affected by the group composition. This work was done by an undergrad at UCSD. Um, and so at first, we tested individual workers in this um, eight-armed maze. We put an individual ant right here in the center. And we put different uh, spices all around it. And we basically counted how many spices it explores in five minutes. And we found that there is great variation in how many of these spices individuals explore. And so um, you can see they explore somewhere from zero to four spices. And this behavior is repeatable. So we could test the same individual day after day, and it, it fell pretty much in the same bin over a week. Um, and so we decided to take the median of this distribution and call everyone below the median non-exploratory individuals and everyone above it exploratory individuals. And we then created uh, groups of mixed individuals. So we had groups of all exploratory ants, groups of um, all non-exploratory ants, and groups that were mixed half and half. And then we gave them another essay. This time it was in the collective um, context, where we put them in one little container, which we call their home. And it was connected with a tea maze to two other containers that had dirt in them, just like the first one. But one was covered and one was uncovered. Ants usually preferred the covered nests. And we slowly flooded their home. Um, and it sounds evil, but these ants are actually used to it because they live in the floodplains of Argentina. So they're actually used to their homes being flooded. And then they emerge and go and look for a new home. And so we looked at how, um, in each of these uh, different types of groups, how quickly they, ex they, they explore this environment and whether they were able to select the covered versus uncovered depending on which group they belong to. And so the first thing we found is that the all exploratory individuals were much better at distinguishing the covered nests from the uncovered nests. So you can see here the dark bars are the are number of trips to the covered nest, the open ones are to the uncovered nest, and this first group was um, basically the only one who, that was able to distinguish between the two. And when we look at overall um, trips on this team maze, the all exploratory individuals were much more active and, and faster in investigating this area. Now, um, you can see that the half and half falls kind of between the all exploratory and all, all non exploratory individuals. And so I ran a bootstrap um, just combining the red and the blue ones to see if the purple one was different from uh, whatever mean we would get just by a simple bootstrap. And it wasn't different from that, which led me to determine that these effects of the exploratory individuals on the non exploratory individuals are additive and not synergistic. Obviously, now we need to mark individuals and follow them and see who, who is actually doing the work in this uh, mixed group. But um, we're still, we still need to find a good method that doesn't kill the ants when we paint them. Yes? So why was this experiment done with groups of eight at a time, the other one with just one at a time? No, these are groups of 10. So these are eight groups of 10. So why was this one done in groups and the other one was done with just one ant? This one was also groups. Yeah. So we first tested what you mean yeah, this one? This one? So that's done with one ant at a time. Right. So we wanted to first determine the behavior of each individual. Oh, so and then we created different. groups that combine either all exploratory or, or uh, that combine exploratory and non-exploratory individuals. So basically, this study suggests that um, the mean of the colony determines whether um, they are fast or slow, whether they can find um, a nest quickly or not, and whether they can determine between covered and uncovered nests. Moving on to the different distributions um, idea. So here I want to introduce a study system that I started working on about a year ago um, with my collaborator, Jonathan Pruitt. Um, and we're looking at um, these social spiders, the Godifus dimicola. And so um, it's very similar to the social insects. They live in these, all well, mostly female groups. And they care for their brood together. They build their uh, webs together. They capture prey together. Um, but they have eight legs and not six. Um, and so when we go out to the field and look at the behavior of these spiders, we find that there's variation within a colony in their boldness. Boldness being basically how quickly they recover from us puffing air on them. So we puff air on them, we wait um, for up to five minutes, uh, for up to 10 minutes, and then see how quickly they start crawling around again after we puff air on them. 
And so these are examples of colonies in the field. Um, each of one of the dashed lines is a different colony. And I just separated them into two types of um, distributions uh, to kind of explain here that um, what we usually see is there are a lot of shy individuals out here on the left side. Um, and then sometimes you get this kind of bimodal distribution where we have a few more uh, bold individuals. Sometimes you don't have that many bold individuals. But basically, um, most of the individuals are shy and few of them are, are bold. And this influences their collective behavior, um, basically how they collectively capture prey. And so what we see is that having, oh, sorry, so we call these bold Sorry. We call these extremely bold individuals keystone individuals because of how they influence the collective behavior. And so what we see is um, that if we take a group of shy individuals and we place just one bold individual in the group, it will expedite its prey capture behavior. So we can compare them to all shy groups. We, can, we compare the shy groups with just one bold individual to all shy groups, and we see um, this change in collective behavior. And it turns out that um, the boldness of the keystone individual influences how much they will expedite their uh, prey capture. So here you see the boldness of the keystone individual, 600 being the boldest, and here you see the latency to attack prey. So shorter times means faster, and so you can see that as the um, keystone individual is bolder, we get faster uh, latencies to attack prey. Um, interestingly, this latency to attack prey is uh, related to the proportion of mass gained. So this does have um, consequences to the spiders themselves, right? So you do want to capture prey faster because um, you're going to gain more weight as you do that. Um, now, we found that the effect of the keystone individual on the other group members is proportional to how long it has been in the colony. And so what we did is we took uh, groups, again, we took groups of all shy individuals, added just one keystone individual. Um, and we added the keystone individual at different times before day zero here. So some groups had um, the keystone individual for 20 days, some groups had the keystone individual for 10 days, and some groups had the keystone individual for five days. And then we went and removed the keystone individual and looked at the relationship, that relationship that I just showed you, between the boldness of the keystone individual and the latency to capture prey, to attack prey. And so what you see is that in the groups that had the keystone individual for 20 days before removing it, this relationship between um, boldness of the keystone individual and, and speed of capturing prey persisted throughout for the next 24 weeks, so for more than three weeks afterwards. But groups that had the keystone individual just for a few days before removing it and basically lost this effect of the keystone individual on the collective prey. And we can compare this to the control groups where a, we removed the shy individual. So these are groups that had their keystone individual, in, the boldest individual um, in the group was never removed. We just removed a shy individual. And again, the keystone individual was in there for either 5, 10, or 20 days. But as long as it was there, um, the, its effect persisted. And so um, that led us to ask if the identity of the keystone individual is what matters, or if it's just the fact that there is an individual who is bolder than everyone else. And so we conducted an, another experiment where we had groups of um, all shy individuals, one keystone individual, and we replaced that boldest individual twice a week with someone else from the same colony who is also very bold. And in our control groups, we replaced someone who is um, shy, and always the same individual, so that we're replacing only one individual in the colony. And then we had control groups where we didn't replace anyone. And, what we f and then we tested their, a, their a latency to attack three times once a week afterwards. And so what we found is that in the groups where we replaced that bold individual, um, the latency to attack pretty much stayed the same for the three weeks. Um, the groups where we did no replacements, it pretty much stayed the same and even went down, it, they even became faster over time. Um, and the groups, the control groups where we replaced that shy individual, not the keystone. So the keystone was always the same, but a shy individual was, was perturbed. They actually decreased their latency to attack, so they did worse. Um, so we can think about different stories of why this might happen. Perhaps some, you know, the keystone, the bold individual is more prone to being, a, a, to, to disappearing because it is overall bolder, it does more um, activities outside, and perhaps its loss is not as um, detrimental to the colony as if someone who is shy and perhaps doesn't engage in, in these risky behaviors, um, when those are lost, the colony might, be, um, might become less active and, and 
have longer latencies to attack. Um, we also looked overall at the behavior of the other individuals in the group. And so we found that individuals in the group where we repla repeatedly replaced the bold individual over time increase their boldness. So this group here, it's possible that it's not that individual that we kept on replacing, that bold individual that we kept removing and replacing that's doing this job. In fact, it's not. <laughs> we looked at that too. Um, but what's happening is other individuals are changing their behavior. And we have evidence for that also from the previous um, study I, show, I showed you where we removed the keystone individuals, yet it affects persisted. So something is happening. It has an effect on the other individuals in the group. Um, again, when we didn't replace anyone, um, even when we didn't replace anyone, the boldness overall increased. Um, but when the shy individual was repeatedly replaced overall, they kept their boldness. And so this is one of the things we're looking at now is to see how interactions between individuals in the group influence their boldness. And so uh, this is just one example of some of the um, data we're working with now. Actually, Edmund, who's sitting right there, is working with where we have groups of um, all shy and one bold individual. And we look at their interactions over time. And we look at their boldness over time. And you can see that it actually changes a little bit. And the question is whether the boldness, whether your boldness is determined by who you interact with, whether the interactions in different situations influence what your boldness is. And so um, this is something that we are currently looking at um, to see, to determine what, what's, what's underlying this, these dynamics of boldness in the group. Um, some um, said stuff we already know about how these interactions affect boldness and other um, interesting features of the colony is that the social interactions influence disease transmission. And so in this example, what I'm showing you here, this is a, a spider under a microscope and with UV light on it. And so this is just a normal spider. We didn't do anything to it. And this spider was infected with a bacteria that's um, a cuticular bacteria that has a GFP um, a little GFP tag in it. So we can see it, it glows in the light, basically it glows under UV light. And these are these blue streaks here that are marked with the yellow arrows. And so we can basically mark the bacteria on the, on the cuticle of the spiders and put spiders of different behaviors with one another and examine the transmission of these bacteria from one spider to another. And so in this study, what we found was that if we put spiders of very different boldness, um, they're less likely to transmit the bacteria than when we put spiders of very similar boldness. So if we put a very bold and a very bold spider together, these bacteria, these bacteria are more likely to transmit from one another. Um, but if we put a very bold with a very shy, it's, these bacteria are less likely to transmit. Now when we go and look at what the groups are doing, these groups of spiders, um, in this example, we have a social network where each node is a spider and each link is an interaction between spiders while they're resting. And the color of the nodes indicated the, indicates their boldness. So the bolder they are, the more red they are, and the whiter they are, the less bold they are. And looking at a, a lot of these networks, we found that spiders tend to disassort according to their boldness. So they tend to sit next to individuals who are different from their own boldness. And so this potentially could be a type of a kind of social immunity, a behavioral immunity, where you want to be next to others that are less similar to you, and uh, which, we also, which we were able to find that we are less likely to get bacteria from them. Um, we followed this study up with um, looking at groups of different compositions. So, how does the group composition influence disease transmission? And so we had groups of all shy individuals, 10% bold individuals, and 40% bold individuals. And we infected either a shy individual, so that's the shy index case, or the boldest individual, so the keystone individual. And we infected them with the um, bacteria. And we looked at um, how many other individuals, what the proportion of the, uh, of the what proportion of the colony was exposed. So basically, what proportion of the colony became infected with these tagged bacteria. Um, and so we found that, in fact, the, the ones that had um, just 10% bold individuals, so the fewest amount of bold individuals, had the lowest um, transmission, basically had the, the least other individuals infected. Um, but the all shy and the 40% bold um, were more highly infected than these ones. Interestingly, there was no difference whether 
it was the keystone or just a random shy individual that were infected. So there was no difference between these, each of these pairs. And so that was an interesting idea. But it is nice to see that the ones that had the kind of a, a more skewed distribution of boldness were also um, the least able to transmit. So we already have two evidence that, that having a, a keystone individual is good. It's good in the, situ in the context of capturing prey, and it's um, apparently doesn't cause the it's also okay, good in the context of disease transmission. Um, and so he, these are um, the, just a portion of colonies um, that exhibited any contact with the index case, so just trying to find out the, what, what is the mechanism here. And so even though um, these 10% bold individuals were less, a, less infected than the others, um, the 40% bold individuals actually had fewer interactions with that infected individual. And so something else might be going on. The transmission might be secondary here. But having a, having a leader might cause errors. For example, if the leader is misinformed. Um, this is a benign example from ants. There are others that you can think of in, in real life. Um, and so we look at what happens if the keystone individual has the wrong information. So what we did was we taught the uh, keystone individual, so the bold individual in the group, to associate a certain vibratory stimulus with prey. So spiders cue in on vibrations on their web, and we can give them different vibratory stimuli, um, basically you know, shake at different rates. And we can associate prey with a certain vibratory stimulus. And if we reinforce this association um, to a spider, it actually learns that, this is, that it feels the same vibratory response and it should go and attack. And so what we did here, we either um, taught this association to a keystone individual or to just a generic um, random shy individual. Um, and then in the control individual, in the control groups, nobody knew this association. So these are examples, so the red lines are examples of groups in which the a generic, just a shy individual was taught this association. The Pink ones are groups in which the keystone individuals was taught this association, and the gray ones are groups in which nobody was taught this association. And then we gave this, them the same vibratory stimulus over time. We gave it to them 12 times. Um, and we found that the groups that had this one individual that was taught to associate the, stimu the vibratory stimulus with the um, prey were much faster at attacking this vibratory stimulus. But the control group that had nobody in there that knew this association were slower all along. They, sl they got better over time. Now we then um, had the same setup where one individual knew something, uh, knew this association between prey and, uh, and a vibratory stimulus. And we now gave the colonies a different stimulus, something completely different that nobody has ever seen. But they had an individual that knew to associate another vibratory stimulus with prey. And so in the control groups where no one um, knew this association, again, they got better over time. Um, in the when, when the shy individual had this association between a certain vibratory stimulus, different from what we gave them in the collective um, setting, and, a pre and prey, they also did just as well as the control groups. But when a group had a keystone individual that knew the association between a different vibratory stimulus and prey, they really didn't respond to this new vibratory stimulus. It took them a really long time. And in fact, what happened here is we just removed, between, 10 and, between the 10th trial and the 11th trial, we removed that keystone individual that knew this um, bad information, this information that they weren't receiving. And so having a keystone individual that is associating a certain vibratory stimulus with prey but not another could actually harm the colony, um, especially if they're exposed to many types of prey that will vibrate in different ways. And we term this the Achilles heel hypothesis. Um, so just to give you an idea of where this work is going on forward to, um, so we're looking now at trade-offs of having a keystone individuals in different environments. So potentially certain environments that have more prey um, and more uh, disease could have certain compositions, um, whereas Places that don't have as much prey and potentially don't have as much disease might have different compositions or the influence of the keystone on these societies might be different in these different areas. We actually have some preliminary data that is supporting that. Um, I mentioned the idea that we're looking at how interactions influence boldness transmission. Um, we're going to start looking at gene expression and how that, if there's any differences in, in 
and gene expression between bold and shy individuals, if interactions influence this gene expression, and then um, continue our work on disease dynamics and look at expression of immune genes. So kind of getting under the skin to see how all this influences the collective level. Um, so staying for a little bit longer in this different distribution hypothesis, I'm going to go back to things you might remember now from my talk a few years ago, but it leads nicely to the different environments hypothesis. So I'm going to go through them briefly. Um, I'm going go to the, um, to go back to social insects, so leaving the spiders aside, um, and slowly focusing on the foraging regulation of harvest rands. And so what harvest rants do in the morning, they leave their nest, they go look for food, which is seeds that are scattered in the environment. Um, and as ants return with food, more ants will respond in and go out to collect more seeds. And the colony regulates this very carefully because um, this species lives in the desert, and so um, they could desiccate because of the heat, so they don't want to be out for too long. Um, there could be predators in the environment, so they don't want many ants out there when they're um, lizards to eat them, and a lot of this, uh, and this has been, um, this regulation has been examined by my postdoc advisor for decades before I joined her lab, and at that time, um, the hypothesis of what's going on is, was that ants inside um, the nest are basically waiting for ants to return, and it's the interactions with these returning individuals that influences whether or not they're going to leave the nest. And so I wanted to look at, at these interactions that are happening inside the nest entrance. And so first thing, I, I tracked individuals inside an ant, inside a lab nest. And so what you see here is the first chamber that ants will reach when they come in from the arena through this tube, and then they'll leave that entrance chamber through the um, towards the inner nest through that other tube. And if you run this for just five minutes, you get these um, works of modern art created by ants. And so we have. Here are trajectories of ants walking in and out of that tube. You see some trajectories going through that, that tube. This is an ant that really didn't move much the whole time, and so on. And from this, we can then construct, oh, sorry, just to orient you, this is going to the arena and that to the internet. Um, and so from this, we can construct the interaction networks of the ants. And um, I wanted to examine two hypotheses because um, the idea was that these interactions will influence how quickly information spreads in the colony about a new food resource. And so the two kind of predominant hypotheses in the literature are that the interaction distribution among ants um, can be uniformly distributed. So if we have, uh, for example, a good example is transportation networks. So ro a road transportation network is, has a pretty much uniform distribution where most cities have pretty much the same, similar number of big roads that arrive to them, come and, come and go. Um, an alternative hypothesis is that the uh, distribution of links of nodes is, is right skewed, where we have few individuals, or in this case cities, that have a lot of connect connections and most individuals have very few. So an example here is the air traffic um, network. And so you have places like LAX or Chicago that are hubs and have many, many flights coming into them, but most cities have just a few. And so we get these skewed distributions. And the idea is that these skewed distributions are faster for, for inf certain information flows than these ones. And so I wanted to see which ones um, the ants match. And so when you look at the actual interaction networks of the ants, here each node is an ant, each line is an interaction, and the color codes the number of interactions. And so the um, darker red ones are the highly interactive individuals, and the blue ones are the less interactive individuals. And so what you see here is that we have a few, these are two colonies, and what we see here is that we have just a few individuals in each colony that are highly interactive, but most everyone else is not very interactive. And when you look at the distribution um, of interaction, it looks like this, and, which is right skewed. And just to remind you, if it was a normal distribution or everyone was interacting pretty much the same, we would have something like this. Um, I won't bore you. That, uh, we ran a little model that looks at different um, interaction patterns, and I won't bore you with the details. But basically, it showed that these skewed networks are indeed faster at um, transmitting information among colonies, uh, within a colony. Um, it turns out that these interaction hubs are persistent. So I went and tagged ants and looked at them over time and uh, found that some individuals are persistently more interactive than the others. And, it turned, and then I ran some simulations to look at how this persistent behavior influences a network structure. And so it turns out that the environment in which the ants are actually influences how their persistent behavior 
determines the network structure. And so what I mean by this is, if ants are very persistent in how many individuals they interact with, and they're in a confined environment, this persistence is going to lead to these very skewed interaction networks. But if we have the same persistence level, so some individuals are very persistent in how many others they will interact with and be very interactive and hubby, and we remove basically the boundaries of the nest so we kind of let them roam outside with no boundaries to kind of put, bring them back together, um, the effect of persistence on network structure basically disappears. So it doesn't matter if you have persistent ants or you don't have persistent ants, you're going to always get the same distribution of interactions, which I found was really it's kind of surprising when I ran these simulations. Um, Oh, sorry, I have some animations to show this. So when you put them inside, you get these uh, ski networks, and when you put them outside, um, you get these uniform networks. And so one could make up a story that outside you don't want them, you don't want one individual to be very important because if a lizard comes and eats it, you're going to lose that hub of information flow. Whereas inside, they're more protected, and uh, potentially um, the likelihood of losing one of these red in interactive individuals is uh, lower. Uh, but this basically leads me to the idea that environment can influence how um, colonies behave and why certain colonies behave in certain ways and others in other, way, in other ways. Um, so the first thing I'll show you is, um, so this is a little schema, um, kind of experimental scheme I came up with to look at interactions in the field. And so what you're seeing here is um, this used to be the opening of the nest. And these are tunnels that lead into a deeper chamber. And what you see here is a, what we call the entrance chamber. And what I did was scrape the ceiling of this entrance chamber and replace it with a Petri dish. And so then we can see ants coming in with um, food and coming out. And we can count their interactions and see where their interactions happen and so on. Um, we got a lot of interesting information about this. But the, one that I the point that I want to focus on now is the spatial distribution of these interactions. And so here are three colonies, for example. And what you see is our, our maps of interactions. So the redder colors indicate more frequent interactions. The bluer colors indicate fewer interactions. And what you see is that there are um, interaction hotspots that end up being really close to the tunnels, um, exits, and entrances. So this used to be the nest entrance. This is a tunnel that leads deeper inside the nest. And um, you see that the hotspots happen near those entrances. And we see the same pattern in the lab. So again, this is that same um, nest chamber I showed you in the beginning. And those um, squares indicate where the um, opening of the tunnels are. And it turns out that where ant, the longer the ant spends in one of these interaction hotspots, the more interactive it is. So I asked if nest architecture can affect the collective behavior of a colony. And so the idea was that we have different colonies with different nest structures. Nest structure influences where interactions happen. This in, in affects how much interactions each individual has, which could influence their interaction network, which could influence how um, they forge. And so to look at the influence of a nest architecture on collective behavior, I turned to this um, harvester, the, the true harvester ant here in California. Um, and so the nice thing about this ant is that it has this very interesting collective behavior where it translocates, where it relocates from one nest to another. Um, and so here, this colony is relocating from a nest over here um, to a nest about 30 meters down over there by the door. Um, and so you see ants carrying the larvae and, and pupae, and you see the winged individuals that are about to fly off on their mating flight. And so basically what you see in the field is something like this. You go to the field and there's a Swiss cheese of nests. And some of these nests will be active and will have ants at them. And then you come back after a couple of days and one of these nests is no longer active, but a, a nest not far from there is active. And so you can infer that that colony moved. Um, and this can happen in many places. And sometimes you're lucky and you actually get to see the move. And so the nice thing about this scheme is that it allows us to look at the behavior of an ant, of an ant colony in one site and then look at the behavior of the same colony at a different nest site. And so that's what I did. I, I asked if colonies change their behavior when they move among nest sites. I looked at two, um, different, uh, two different behaviors. First was responsiveness, so how quickly they come to food, piece of apple here, or how quickly they uh, retreat from a fierce predator, which was me blowing air on them. Um, and another one, which was a more, so this was more colony level behavior, and one that was a more individual based behavior, which was just speed. So how quickly they moved 
accede towards the nest and how quickly did they remove a debris from the entrance chamber, in this case a toothpick. Um, and I found, the first thing I found was that nest site, nest site affected the colony responsiveness. So colonies differed more among than within a nest in their responsiveness. So I repeatedly looked at, at colonies at the same nest multiple times and then the same nest, a different nest multiple times and I was able to compare um, within and between differences and the among nests were more different than within a nest. Another interesting finding was that recruitment to food and um, the response to alarms so these collective level behaviors were related and um, were correlated when ants moved among nest sites, but those individual based behaviors were not, um, which again led me to think that maybe something about the nest site determines their collective actions. And so then I moved to San Diego and I replicated this study and I looked at the ants at the colonies um, in different places. I, I, I looked at their um, foraging behavior, or recruitment to an apple at one site, and I waited for them to move out. And so I, was, I looked at, I have multiple observations at a, a particular nest site and then I waited for them to move out. And then I came with a, a big bowl of plaster and I poured it down their nest and I came and I dug it up after a few days and this is completely staged because I had lots of little helpers do this work. And so what I got from this were these casts of their nest um, and I could determine, um, you know, the chambers and the tunnels and, and so on, various features of this in cast. And I digitized it and I quantified it as a network because I like networks. Um, so here, for example, each node is a chamber and the links are tunnels and I just color coded them by different types of chambers, but it's not relevant right now. Um, and then we can start looking at the structure of the network and see if it relates to the collective behavior that we observed before they left the nest. And so I had lots of these casts, uh, which meant I lot of, had lots of these networks. And so I decided to find, a, well, I, I thought of certain attrib network attributes that, will, that potentially could influence recruitment to see if they relate to their collective behavior. And so the ones that I looked at were um, the, connect the connectivity of the entrance chamber. So this first chamber that they arrive at as they come from the entrance. Um, I looked at overall connectivity. So just overall how connected are the various chambers. And then it, you'll notice here there is this interesting cycle. We call that a cycle in Netflix. Um, and so it can relate to how robust a nest is to being broken, to, to, to damage, external damage. Because you can imagine that if this tunnel is broken, there's still a way to reach from here to here. There's still a way to reach from here to here, even if this tunnel is broken. But in other cases, if you break a tunnel, you lose all the connectivity there. And so one way to quantify it is a meshedness, which is the number of cycles over the number of possible cycles. And just to show you an example of what this might look like, here are two networks with a similar number of edges, uh, sorry, similar number of nodes. Um, but this one here has a lot more cycles than this one. And so its meshedness is much higher than this one, even though the number of nodes is similar. And so I then looked at how recruitment speed uh, relates to these different me network measures. And I found that um, recruitment speed increases with chamber connectivity, with the entrance chamber connectivity. So the more connected this first chamber they arrive to, to other chambers, the faster they are to recruit, uh, at recruiting to food. Overall connectivity also positively related with uh, recruitment to food. And finally, um, this measure of, of nest robustness and connectivity robustness also related positively with, uh, with speed to recruitment to food. Interestingly, um, there was no relationship between the volume of the chambers and the speed of recruitment, which suggests that it's not just the number of ants that a nest can hold, but how it is arranged that influences the recruitment to food. Um, and so I found that architecture influences collective behavior. We don't really, I don't have a mechanism of how, but obviously what I think is happening is that somehow the architecture is influencing the interactions. Um, and so now we're looking at different structures and modifying the number of connections we have. Um, we can block different, connect, different tunnels and, and look at the behaviors of the ants inside. And so we have lots of these that we're currently analyzing. Um, so next time I give a talk at Beck, I can tell you all about this. Uh, but another piece of interesting feature work that I want to end with is linking it to human behavior. I figured this is a good crowd to chat with about this. Um, and so at a conference a couple of years ago, I met um, Steve and Guy, and we were chatting. About, I was telling him about this architecture finding because I had just found it, and I was very excited about it. Um, and Steve pointed me to this study about um, from, from Michigan University about how 
um, proximity and, and network structure of, of offices influences scientific collaboration. So basically collective behavior of individual, of uh, humans, scientists in this case. And so what they did there is they took two buildings um, from the same, that are occupied by the same department and they quantified the paths of different people in this building. So this, this is one, person one's office, this is his la the lab, the restroom, the staircase, elevator, and so on, and the same for person two. And they basically quantified the amount of path overlap between these individuals, and they created these networks. And so they were able to um, compare networks in one building to another building, and they found that the buildings that facilitate more interactions and more connected networks also facilitated more collaborative papers and more collaborative successful grants. Um, and so this is something that's becoming more, in, people are, so social scientists are interested in, the, in this question clearly. Um, and so we thought we would join forces in between the biologists and the social scientists and see if we can learn from each other some things. And so this October we put together a workshop that was comprised by um, architects, social scientists, and biologists. We were exactly third, third, third. Um, so this is, these are the people there. Um, and we looked at the effect, that we, we talked for two days about the effects of architecture on collective behavior from social insects to humans. Um, and we're now working on putting together some manuscripts, hopefully, um, about some of our conversations there. And so just to give you an idea of what the conversation, when you put an architect, a biologist, and a social scientist in one room, what are some of the conversations end up being about. Um, so one was, if, obviously, if we can identify general principles that um, impact the collective behavior of both humans and animal systems. You can I guess there were some physicists in there. Um, we, were, we thought about harnessing and mimicking animal builders for human structures. People have been thinking about that for a while, but kind of thinking about more ways to do that. Um, the idea of emotions came up, so um, something that the biologists didn't necessarily think about, but the architects and social scientists um, definitely raised that, that that is something that's considered by architect, human, architects for human structures. Um, and so how did those impact the interactions between architecture and collective behaviors at all levels? Um, and then whether um, what are some of the effects of architecture on information flow and processing? Um, and along the same lines, how um, the built environment influences health behaviors and disease transmission. Um, so kind of transmission, how, how architecture influences transmissions of various things. How do we quantify um, these effects? Um, finding t tools that both um, people who study humans and people who study biological systems can work with. And um, I guess how does the legibility and eligibility of built environments influence collective outcomes? And then the last one was how do we actually translate this to um, can, we, can we even implement um, architectural designs that we think about um, in biological systems to facilitate collective outcomes in, in humans? Um, and so basically what I, so in this talk I showed you that there are different ways to, that worker composition can influence collective behavior. Um, obviously we can think about what are the mechanisms that underlie um, individual variation among the workers in the first place. So there could be things like um, that happen during the development. Perhaps some individuals are raised in, in different conditions than others. I mentioned gene expression. Um, this is something that we're starting to look at in the spiders and the Argentine ants a little bit too. Um, chemistry is a big thing in social insects. So um, we can look at how ants interact with the chemicals. These are beads that are coated with, with the cuticle or hydrocarbons of other ants. Um, and in fact, we do know that the, the, cue, the chemical cues are what influence um, the collective decisions of the, of the workers. So they will cue in on chemicals that of both a forager and a food, but they won't respond to just food or just forager smell. Um, we can then go to the other side and ask what things at the, what are some things at the population level that might influence um, these dynamics. I mentioned a little bit about that in the spider system. Perhaps different environments require different compositions. Um, in the um, harvester ant species, we now have information from two sites in California, and it turns out that they actually do behave differently. These populations behave differently. Um, this is from San Diego. This is from up near Stanford in 2010, and this is up near Stanford in, in 1994. And we see that um, what I'm showing you here is the number of relocations that these ants have, and they relocate a lot more in the south. And so again, we have different situations. We think this has to do with competition and, and resources. Um, so that could influence, obviously, the way um, different colonies behave. And finally, obviously, different species have different uh, needs, even if they do have similar um, 
ecological uh, niches, they st we still have different behaviors um, and, and different species, which could influence how the, these, different, these uh, differences we see in individual variation in collective behavior. And so by looking at different species and different um, modeling techniques and network analysis and various image analysis, um, my lab looks at individual variation in collective behavior. And with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and funding and locations that allowed me to study these um, things and take questions. So can you, <clears throat> it's hard to process, there's so much, I mean, awesome, incredible amount of material, really impressive, but can you go back to the slide where you showed the effects of, in the spiders of removing the keystone individual and the number of days um, yeah, that it took effects. for the change in the collective behavior of the corn. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So um, the there are two explanations. It seems to me, and forgive me for not having read any of the you know, library worth of papers to cite here, um, uh, but. There, there are two possible explanations, and I say that because perhaps you've already addressed this in the paper, but um, uh, uh, for the, the inertia of um, the colonies in which the keystone individuals is removed late, right? Um, so one explanation is um, the dynamics of behavior have changed in the sense that the other animals have altered their behavior, and as a consequence, they just keep doing what they're doing even though there is no actual utility in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically a byproduct of some uh, contagion of, um, of uh, increased boldness, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's another explanation as well, which is that um, uh, other individuals may be using the bold individuals as a cue of the hazardous of the environment. Mm -hmm. So if I have a bold individual in my colony and that individual persists for quite a long time and continues to be bold, mm -hmm. then that's a good indication to me that the world is pretty safe, right? Because I got this risk-taking, you know, um, crazy guy who goes out there and, and, you know, gives the middle finger to the predators of the world and comes back each time, mm -hmm. okay? So that tells me, oh, I live in a pretty safe place. But stuff still happens because there are random events in the world, and so eventually that individual stops coming home. But I'm convinced now that the world is pretty safe, and so as a consequence of that, I continue following a pattern of behavior that is functional in light of the cue that I've received from that individual prior to her departure. Right? Um, it seems like one way of testing between those possibilities, and this, trying to put a little twist here, gets to your point about emotions at the very end, Right, would be you would expect there to be an interaction with cues of predation. So, um, uh, if I present, I don't know, the scent of a predator or something. I don't know what the what the spiders are sensitive to. But um, uh, uh, if I present the scent of a predator in the environment, okay, and I have a bold individual in my colony, and she goes out and boom, she's gone. Okay, that's a good indication that you know um, that. It really pays to be shy in this world. Mm -hmm. But if there's a scent of the predator in the environment and the bold individual keeps going out and coming back and going out and coming back, then now I'm going to discount the cue of the scent. Mm -hmm. right? um, so that potentially gives me a way of leveraging between or, or, or differentiating between the, the sort of byproduct inertia explanation, which is not functional at all, right? mm -hmm. and uh, using others behavior as a cue. And I, I mentioned the twist with emotion because conceivably, you know, disease transmission and predation are, you know, two principal problems. Mm -hmm. And um, they're analogs, not homologs, despite what some of my colleagues in the discussed world might argue. Um, uh, that, that, you know, that animal hygiene behavior and disease avoidance is discussed. I think that's totally wrong. Um, I, I think it's an analogous trick, not a homologous one. But it's reasonable to think that there's some motivational system underlying their response to those cues. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you frighten animals with predation cues, or you disgust animals, those are in scare quotes, because mm -hmm. certainly the disgust case is not a model of this, um, uh, you are, in a sense, 
you know, you're altering their, the informational environment, you're altering their motivational incentives. There's every reason to think you're altering their inner states, and therefore there's something like an emotion going on there. It's not that that is totally beyond the realm of what you can investigate with the model animals you're yeah. using. Yeah. These are fantastic points. So in the future talk, I'll have a few slides about response to predation, because we actually do have some information about that now. So first of all, in the misinformation study, the next one I showed, where if we coupled cues with, with food, we did the same with predators. Okay. Um, and we see the same pattern. So when a keystone individual has misinformation about predators, the colony actually does continue to respond to them. For a, a, well, oh, sorry, when the keystone individual has misinformation about a predator, yeah, the colony continues to respond to it, even though it's really detrimental um, not to know which cue to connect with the, right, with, with the predator. Um, but when there is a shy individual who that association, they did. So that kind of goes a little bit to your question about motivation. But something that we're just working, actually, the manuscript is in my inbox right now, <laughs> waiting to go to finish some final edits on, is looking at what happens when we give them a scent of a predator. And we are finding that this association, exactly this correlation between keystone boldness and number of attacks, disappears when they have um, this predation cue. Um, and so it seems like when they do sense a predator in the environment, often having a bold individual there is you know, masked by this really dangerous cue. And so that can really mask what the keystone does. Um, and so potentially it changes the keystone, what the keystone does, potentially changes how other individuals are But yeah, so it's something, and it's a great idea that we're you know, pursuing now, and hopefully I'll have a better answer in the future, but I agree that there are these two alternative hypotheses. I guess one that kind of um, does support the idea that there is some inertia going on is that when we look at how many of these prey attacks the bold, boldest individual, so the keystone individual actually participates in, um, specifically in this study and other studies, that, like the keystone replacement study that we looked at, they stop participating in prey captures after three days. So. If we look at the proportion of attacks that the keystone individual participated in, it's really, really high for these first two trials, and then it drops to close to 10% or even lower than 10% for the remainder, um, which does suggest that someone has to do these attacks. Of, uh, sorry, it's in the control of the blood obviously, because they're the only ones that have the keystone there. So. Um, but basically, so the keystone individual will participate in attacks for up to three days um, after we start these essays. And then, other individuals will be the ones that are dominating the actual prey attacks. And we saw the same thing happen when we removed, and when we repeatedly replaced the keystone individual. And the group, when the groups where the keystone individual was persistent and we didn't replace it again, we saw that same, same drop after um, that first week. So first week it participated in a lot and then it dropped off. Um, but in groups when we repeatedly replaced the keystone individual, it always stayed very high. So the keystone, so they were kind of always reduced to this and I guess kind of the, the early succession of the group where we're just starting to learn who's there. So that does support a little bit the idea that there is some changes that are happening to other individuals and, and that the Kisan did have some influence. But then there are other individuals that become bold and as we see in the long term kind of data that we take on boldness. And so, you know, they could be pursuing someone else with bold. So it's a good idea, we'll work on it. <laughs> I have a couple of follow ups for that. Wait, my turn. Uh, it, first of all, thank you for such an interesting talk and for sharing so many different studies. Uh, I, you must be 150 years old to tell this. Um, <laughs> so I, I thought one thing you mentioned at the beginning that was just really piqued my interest. You mentioned that um, the reproductive unit in social insects is the colony, and so selection acts on the colony. And I was wondering if you could sort of go back to that idea and just expand a little bit on it and what that means for this work that you're doing on individualism, how selection responds to individual differences. Yeah. So that's exactly the point of this all. So in social insects, the only individual that reproduces that actually produces eggs is the queen. Um, the workers are sterile. And so they don't produce more eggs, it's the queen that produces more eggs, and these eggs will either be workers or new queens that will then go off and do the mating flight and, and create a new colony. Um, so on one on, on one hand, what each individual worker does doesn't really influence its direct fitness, but it does influence whether or not the queen is going to be able to produce more queens and therefore more colonies. So that's why I, I'm, that's why I was saying that the you know, selection acts at the colony level because you know, 
that's where the reproduction happens. Um, but, as I said, what the worker does will influence whether or not its mom will be able to produce more queens and more drones, and um, whether the colony will have food, whether there will be more workers to bring in more food, and, and so there's actually a relationship. So, the Postdoc advisor looked at a, the reproductive success of colonies and how many colonies they are able to a, put out in the field. Um, and so it turns out that how carefully they regulate their foraging behavior influences how many other colonies they, they can produce. But how carefully they regulate their foraging behavior obviously <coughs> is determined by what the individual workers are doing. So they're very tightly linked, um, and you can look at it from both directions, but in the end they're, um, you know, they're a continuum. So, you know, it's, it's a special system in, in which this happens. I don't know if it happens, I don't think it happens in many fragments, although there is an idea, you know, the idea of trait group selection is not, you know, in, in these spiders, for example, all the individuals can uh, reproduce, so they can all lay eggs, but they take care of them collectively, and they're very inbred, and so they're all very highly related to one another. So whether the group succeeds, it does determine how each individual in that group succeeds. So it goes back to this idea of you know, within and between group variation, and which one, which effect is stronger, and which one you know, is, has a you know, which one the environment's influence influences more. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about um, the density of colonies in the environment and how, in terms of, if there is this sort of transfer of, of information, whether having colonies that are more sort of clumped, close, yeah. close together to one another, whether there's any do you know anything about, like, if you can see what members of another colony are, are doing, if that somehow influences where to, their their foraging patterns or anything like that, or if it all seems to be intra-colony? Um, since in the spiders, I wouldn't say they can see very far from their own. They don't okay. move much, and, yeah. and so on. Um, with, the, with the ants, so the, those ants that relocate between nest sites, they go quite a long distance. So a colony could go, you know, from one Site, from one side of my field site to the complete other side of the field site, you know, passing by other colonies. Um, so it's definitely getting uh, information about the foraging, the available forage in the environment. And so one of the things we did when we compared the Stanford data and the um, San Diego data was to look at the um, basically how, how much food is in those two environments, and so and and the density of colonies. And so in San Diego, they're much less dense, and there's much less food. Whereas in Stanford, they're much denser, and there's more food. So they move less, because there's more food. And also, when they move, they could be bumping into other colonies, and, and that's, um, they do fight. They have these big ant wars, where they all kind of tear legs at each other. So <laughs> it could be potentially costly, um, especially if the queen is, is finds herself in the middle of such a war. So, um, so yeah, there is, there's definitely an interaction between um, what the ants do and how they forage and how they decide whether or not to relocate um, and the environment features. And so uh, whether they gather information from other individuals, I don't know if they do so directly. So when two when workers from two colonies meet, they'll fight each other. And so with the, with the red harvester ants in Arizona, um, they'll send patrollers in the morning. The patrollers, if they, if they meet other patrollers from a different colony, they'll go back to the colony and say, we're not foraging in that direction today. We're going to forage in some, in some other direction. So they definitely try to avoid that competition. But indirectly, they definitely get information from other colonies because you know, the food could change based on whether other colonies forage there or not. So they forage in these foraging fan. They'll start with a trail and then and create, kind of basically spread out into a fan and, and collect all the seeds they can see. And so some patch could become depleted faster than another, and so another colony maybe won't find stuff there and will decide to move elsewhere. So, Indirectly, there is that there should be interaction between the colonies and forming them where there's Um, I was wondering if you have any ideas on the differences between the uh, the nest and the, in terms of the number of connections they have, and whether that might be, there might be a functional reason for variation yeah. and nest connections or. So what I was really hoping to find was that you know ants actually did slowly improve and, and move into better and better fields. <laughs> so they don't, you know, it's not like they're in a nest that causes them to forage slowly and then they'll move to a nest that will cause them to forage eh, faster. It doesn't happen. Um, there is a lot of environmental constraints. So my that field site is very rocky, for example. So rocks could actually determine how connected chambers could be. So if you're in a really rocky patch. Um, 
stay determined, but if you're in a patch, it's not very rough, you need to be determined. The other really interesting thing about these nests is that they didn't build them. So remember I showed you that picture of the kind of Swiss cheese of nests. Um, the colony will move into an unoccupied nest, but it's already there. And after it moves, there is no, there, before and after they move, there is no evidence of excavation. So you can see, you see evidence of excavation because you see new dirt coming out, and you see that after the rains. Um, so, you know, so you know what to look for. But they don't excavate the nest. It was already there. So there's a really other interesting question of, you know, someone else built this. And so they're moving into a niche that was constructed by someone else. And so we start talking about, you know, the inheritance of nation and, and, you know, who, who built them and, um, you know, what happened during the development of these uh, niches. And, and so and there could be some renovations, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, they might be renovating you know, the connectivity of the, the tunnels and so on. That would be simple enough. But, um, doesn't, they don't. They definitely don't excavate them. Um, it definitely doesn't have to be their own nest. Um, like I have seen ants move out of one place in a different colony. And things like that. Not a lot, but you see those enough. To, so just yeah. You want to follow up on that? Yes, yeah, so really quickly. So, so when the ants moved into that area, um, they so they'll, 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 they'll have several colonies, and they'll all build nests. And then once there's some sort of like saturation of nests in the environment, instead of building new nests, they just move them on the ones that are already there. Yeah you're thinking about a much more dense environment. It's actually much more sparse. So there are a lot more nests than colonies. So nest is the structure and colony right. is the yeah. organism. So, th so there's a lot more. So for in, in, in the San Diego site, probably at least, I'd say, five to ten nests for each colony. Wow. Um, I mean, a lot of them are unoccupied. At the Stanford site, there were less, but they were hard to see, too, because was, there was more vegetation. So I don't know what the ratio of... I should check, but I don't know what the exact ratio, but they move up to 10 times, so, um, although they could move back and forth, but not, they don't do that a whole lot. Um, so I'd say somewhere between 5 to 10 nests per colony in, in the environment. And so it's, it's fairly sparse. They can, they can choose. So when the question was how do they choose where they move um, and whether they scope out the food in that area and decide to move there because they're going to have more food. Some of what you presented involved you handpicking individuals to make your own colonies that had some kind of desirable characteristics. Yeah. I'm just generally curious how concerned you or other people would be about the validity of yeah. that kind of a method. Well, that's a nice thing about working with birds. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so we can do these manipulations and we've done them enough times and gotten consistent data. So. Um, the thing we're, we're always very careful about is that when we, so when we find colonies in the field, they could be up to 200, 300 individuals. And the groups that we create for our experiments are, um, you know, 10 to 30 individuals, which we also find in the field. We find groups of 10 to 30. So one is we know we're creating groups that are, a, that are natural sizes that we can see in the field. Um, and the other thing that we make sure is that when we do create these groups, we make sure that all the individuals come from the same colony. So they are, are all related, just as related as they were in the other groups. Um, and so obviously there's always, you know, when you do stuff in the lab and you put them in plastic containers as opposed to their nice colors, so there's obviously things that can influence. But we also um, deploy some, so we can create a group and then deploy it back in the field and look at what happens to it. And some of them survive very nicely throughout the whole year. Um, and actually the survival does depend on, on the group composition in some, some species and some sites. So um, I, I, I guess what you're, and if what you're getting at is if there's any recognition or anything like that. We don't know of that right now. So um, we're not too concerned, I guess, about mixing and matching and creating these groups. We actually see it as a strength of the system that we can do this. It kind of goes back to last week's talk about the chimps that you can't create, you know, determine who the keystone individual is going to be, but then this system you can. So. so I want to cling tenaciously to my uh, functionalist explanation. More time to look yeah. at this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, given, so, so you said, in, in your mind, a piece of information that favors the inertia explanation is that after three days, the keystone individual doesn't participate in the attacks that much. What's happened is that the level of boldness has risen in the, in the colony. Yes. Um, one possibility is that 
there are other things that keystone individuals do that increase their risk of suffering predation, right? So they don't just attack sooner, but they venture farther, their day range size is greater, whatever. They, 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 they're more likely to be out when um, predators are active, whatever it is. Okay, there are a bunch of, so assuming that there is temperament um, in these creatures and assuming the temperament is stable, um, if I'm a shy individual in the colony and I observe for three days an individual who is quick to attack, mm -hmm. and I infer from that, not assuming that any of this goes on, but, but that functionally it could be the equivalent, um, I infer that this is an individual who is, you know, um, a risk prone. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that individual sticks around in my colony for quite a while, mm -hmm. and then you remove that individual. I am less likely to infer that that individual has suffered predation than if you remove that individual after a shorter period of time. That is independent of whether our collective boldness changes after three days such that the risk-prone individual isn't actually quick to attack anymore because if the, call that individual sensation seeking, right? There's no thrill for her if everybody, else, after three days, everybody is jumping on the bandwagon and, and being quick to attack. Well, it's no longer a reward for me to be quick to attack. And so I scale back my quickness to attack, but I still wander around a lot. I explore new territory. I'm out after dark or after sunrise or whatever it is, okay. Um, uh, I still, therefore, my presence still constitutes a useful cue to my nestmates as to whether the world is safe or dangerous. So is any of that ecologically feasible, or is that just no so I guess, fantasy world? I guess world? The, the one thing that doesn't, I don't understand completely why your argument would, would work is, why would it be that if it stays there longer, it's less likely to be preyed along, uh, to be preyed on than if it stayed there for less time? I mean, predation is not necessarily um, something uniform throughout time, right? That assumes that predation is uniform. Um, yeah, well, it assumes that, um, the sampling window is somehow related to the, the predation risk within an individual's lifetime, okay? So predation risk might vary all over the place, but if um, uh, for the, you know, what matters is the reproductive span of the individual or something like that, and that if I sample for 12 days, mm -hmm. right, um, then that gives me a pretty good window of the, you know, two months that are, in fact, my total reproductive span or something like that. I'm making this up. I have no idea what these creatures are. Right? So they live for a whole year, and, and basically they, they mature after six or seven months, and then they reproduce, and then they raise their young. And there's some overlap, and the older generation dies, and the new one persists in the same. So what matters is what the variability in predation risk is over the course of that year, right. as opposed to, is 12 days a meaningful right. sample of time for me to gather a picture of what my environment is like, at least for the next month? Right. Mm, perhaps for the next month, I guess it would depend on the season itself um, and where you are in that season. I think it would be too short to gather information. I mean, the difference between three days and twelve days, I don't think, would be enough to determine anything about the long term or like the, the density of predation in there. But I could be wrong. I mean, it's something you could. And, and, I mean, my conjecture hinges on the, on the individuals doing things other than just right. being quick to attack that yeah. also put them at right. increased risk, right. yeah. such that they're, you know, they are canaries in the coal mine is what they are, right, in my thesis. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. they're telling me about the risk of danger in the Yeah, I, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's completely feasible. I mean, the one thing, I mean, in general, it could be that the overall social structure is important because we also saw that when we repeatedly replace a shy individual, we become less responsive to prey. And so, kind of that, I, guess, I don't know if that triggered your thoughts about this, but maybe you guys with this one, the identity one. Right, so this is the gray ones is where we, we repeatedly replace a shy individual, and bold um, treatment is where we repeatedly replace this keystone. So, exactly simulating this 
this repeated disappearance of the keystone and giving them someone else who's full. Um, whereas with Shishai, it's always the same keystone, but a shy individual is being pursued. And they do become slower at attacking prey, perhaps because the dangers are you know, even stronger, because someone shy is not disappearing all the time. Okay? And that's not even a risk taking the individual. Whereas you, you, you're confident that they can differentiate individuals? Uh, no. <laughs> that is an open question. But they behave differently. <laughs> so um, whether or not they can, I mean, we have a lot of evidence that they do respond differently to these different types, right? And the idea that a shy individual with bad information is not as influential as a decent individual with bad information. Um, but when they have good information, they are influential at the same um, level, right? Like the but differentiating from type, between types isn't the same as differentiating same. individuals, right? So if, if, right. if, there's, right. if, there's, right. 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 if there's some phenotypic marker exactly. that tells me exactly. this is a risk-prone yes. individual, yes. Right? Yes. Yes. then you could swap them out and I wouldn't notice exactly. necessarily. Yeah. So I, I, I lean towards the differentiate between types, but it, maybe not individuals, because if it was individuals, then repeatedly replacing the keystone individual would be really um, disruptive, because, you know, <laughs> where did Dan go? Um, but, oh, Dan's gone, but someone, you know, this is not that there's a bold spider. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then someone else is there. Evan is very in bold today, and he's here, so that's fine. So, so the replacement experiment suggests to me that it's, they're keying in on a type and not a particular individual. Um, I had a totally unrelated thought as well, but again, if there's somebody else who wants to speak. Okay, so you mentioned um, in the discussion that you misinformed um, both with re regard to rewards and with regard to these kind of predators. Yeah, I don't think so, that. So, in principle, one would expect there to be any symmetry with regard to um, the tendency to attend to different types of information between rewards and, and predators, yeah. such that the animal should be more conservative right. with regard to right. the use of predation. Yeah. yeah, and the use of predation was a bit noisier than what it should is shown here. Um, so the, they were more careful in kind of all the treatments. They were always more careful in any of them. I can pull it up somewhere. But, maybe for all. but the, the, the idea that the misinformed keystone individuals remained influential, kind of didn't let them um, respond properly to prey was still found there, but it, it dissipated faster. So they quickly, they, they did learn quickly for that's true. Um, the, the distinction was this is nice. <laughs> but, um, right. but yeah, you're right. Uh, coupling with prey, uh, with predator was had more.